Homage to him, the Blessed One, the Worthy One, the Fully Enlightened One. So, what I'm doing, I'm not sure if people grasped what I was doing this week, but uh, every couple of weeks we have a, a bi weekly monastic meeting that is with North American monks and um, or northern continent monks. They come from all over, and uh, I take part in that. I've got to be invited to that, and I've been doing it for a few months. And they had a really great subject this past week, and I decided to roll it over into this class uh, because it's a really important thing that we we all have in our minds about what's happening in the Ukraine, and everybody wants to know at this point what what can we do? What can we do to help people? What can we do to comfort people? We have a migration that's been uh, put in motion from the, this war that is, involves actually millions of people. And um, many people want to know what's the best thing I can do to help someone. So they had a subject that they did and I'm going to see if we can get this. I was going to see if we could get this uh, put up on the on the channel uh, so that uh, you can take a look at what happened. But they went over the subject really well. And I'm going to uh, read to you what I put together first. And then I'm going to go into what they talked about. Because this involved probably close to 30 or 40 monks. And, um, it was really uh, well contributed to. Sometimes they don't talk much. <laughs> and I make a joke because a friend of mine once said uh, that uh, uh, another monastic, it's good you're there. Sometimes I, I say something and then they all start talking. It's really fun <laughs> to help to contribute to this. But now they're pretty active. They're really contributing a lot. And it's not difficult for the facilitator to get them to talking. They're getting more and more comfortable with it. And people are, uh, more monks are coming from different places in the world. And it's really nice to see this happening so that people can, can listen to this afterwards. And I'm going to see about trying to get this one uh, hung up on our channel. Let me go for just a minute and I will be right back. I want to get this um, I want to get this set up for you. Um, mm, whoops. Hey. <laughs> uh, okay. Mm -hmm. I can do this. Whoops. Okay. There we go. Gotcha. So I'm going to take you to what I, I put together. Um, what I like to do is they give us this topic that they're going to go over. And they give it to us about a day and a half before they talk about it. <clears throat> and I like to treat it like a, a little assignment and, and put together some things. And then I'm going to go over some of the things uh, that they said. And, uh, and then I'm hoping that you can visit and see them in action. Uh, and visit this afterwards, we'll try to get it set up for you. But let me go to share screen right now and bring up the sky. Okay. So uh, the topic, they called it entangled within and entangled without. Who will untangle this tangled world? And what it's all referring to is what I just said, what's happening with 
the war and what, how we can help people uh, to help themselves from Buddhist perspective. What can we do? So we must understand what we see and hear as a mess today in this world around us did not happen overnight. And so why should we expect to climb this tree from the top down, meaning bring the instant solution to it? It cannot change without the knowledge we need to know and, uh, and without bringing back a living practice to this Dhamma. And the Dhamma can be shared. Dhamma means teaching. Let's remember that. And it means teaching us how learning how our mind is actually working so that we can deal with the reactions that happen inside of us and all of the fear and the pain and anxiety and exhaustion and everything that we're dealing with. And so we must start at the ground and work our way up the tree according to the natural laws of nature. You'll notice I'm using Buddha Dasa's, Venerable Buddha Dasa uh, gave the example of climbing the tree and how sometimes people want an instant solution, but it's hard to have an instant solution to the things that are going on with us in situations like this. The first thing is that we must practice rebalancing ourselves that seems to be the most successful thing that I have found in teaching. When I'm helping somebody who is faced with exhaustion, who is faced with a lot of stress and a lot of tension and sometimes depression because of living situations going on with COVID and such. So the rebalancing part by reviewing and testing the universal laws that we we tried leaving behind. So this generation has left a lot of knowledge behind, uh, in my opinion, of the natural laws that exist. And part of the natural laws have to do with balancing ourselves about past and future and present. So you take a closer look at what the words past and future and present actually mean and how they operate in our life. Now, I tried to set this up so you could see it kind of clearly um, that you do this by asking the person you're attempting to help tell you, to tell you what is the past. And so past is history, and you encourage them. You can feed them the words, but don't teach them what it is. You want them to say it out loud themselves to you. It is the history, what's behind us. Even from this morning, that's the past, now that we're in the evening. And the past is empty of the past energies that went into whatever happened. So something terrible happens and you need to get yourself as quickly as possible into the present time because that's the way to survive most effectively. And the future, the question is, what is the future? And I gave you the word, it's a mystery. There's no energy here yet for the future because we're simply not there yet. So we need to not burden ourselves with worries. We need to take a look carefully of how much we're fearful of the future and how heavy that can be for us to carry all day long. We have to focus and then look at what the present is, staying in the present time. We don't ask, I can't ask a person, I can't make myself ask a person to stay in the present moment. When I'm first starting to teach a person, it doesn't seem to work, but to Help the person to stay in the present time is the first level of attempting to learn about the possibility that you can stay in the present moment later. And using one day's energy at a time and not giving that energy to the past, giving it to the future worries or the past 
emotional part of what just happened. And so this is a balancing lesson is what this is first. And using one day's energy at a time means you're living one day at a time. And that's all you can do in this situation. All you can do is look at for one day at a time. Can I get enough water? Can I get enough food? Do I have enough strength to carry what I'm carrying? Or am I trying to take too much? Is, can I leave some? How am I going to get through one day at a time? Can I help someone? Can someone help me? And that's what we see a lot of. And it's the one thing a couple of people have pointed out in this situation is that what we're seeing is that there is something happening in humanity of people really outreaching to these people and helping them as much as possible. We didn't see this in past uh, past uh, disasters as much as openly as just vividly there of opening their homes and opening the way for them in the neighbor countries to help people to come in. What happened this last week to me was extraordinary. Uh, in Poland, they took so many people and they made the decision to give them all identity cards and to give them uh, benefits and to try to give them support. And of course, they realized they're going to need $800 million to support them. But the fact is they want to be more organized about what's happening and help these people from the time they come in, they are a person, an identity, a part of the country, and they want to help them as much as possible. This is really progress. I think we should look at it and see it as progress in what I've seen in the past and other things. So we must understand how the three characteristics of existence affect our life in this experience right now, whatever we're going through. And so just to go over them briefly, number one, everything is impermanent. The change is inevitable. And this is absolute throughout the entire universe. Everything is changing all the time. Although change is uncomfortable, it can also mean that no one is stuck. This is, this is key in this situation. Why are we stuck? Why is this happening to us? What have we done to deserve this? Is the frame of mind that instantly comes up when the storm comes through and your house is turned upside down immediately or crushed. I mean, that's the first thing that comes. What have I done wrong? But if you don't like it that way, you need to remember it is now the way it is now you can change it and if you are even in a situation like this encouraging people this is what we're talking about hope in another way i have hope i can change something the second one is without proper knowledge of how things work we will simply continue to reflect how so many people choose to take things very personally and we will continue to suffer in that way so proper knowledge of how this works mean proper knowledge of how is this suffering actually working in me as a human being and the problem for us today the challenge is we don't have this happening in our education system that i know of you know, I haven't seen it in a number of years the way I used to examine it when my children were growing up, but people tell me it's still the same. We don't get this information about human cognition and how things work, even though the science is right there now in our school systems. It's not taught in the health class the way other things are normally taught in health class and high school and things. So a lot of people don't have this and just encouraging them to understand uh, how this is working is probably the next little key thing here. Let's put it as there so we're not, oops, there. 
And number three, the trick is to practice never minding change when it's happening, when it's coming up, choosing to see things through a more impersonal view. It's time to stop fighting against the truth of the here and now. So that's looking again at staying in the present time. And number four, then it's time to begin to actually practice change, practice the change or accepting change as the, the, the soup of the day, so to speak. A little patience and a powerful new balance will begin to develop to help steer towards a good change in the future. So, phew, wow, feeling much lighter, just talking to someone. I had the opportunity, I was in the hospital for a while uh, with a very serious cold that came up when I was doing some surgery and stuff. And I had to go through that. And there was a, a person on night duty who came to visit me, a doctor who, who was in a situation of challenge living situation and we talked about things going on and these are the things that are bringing the person into balance first because when they first start to talk to you when something is really ripping a person apart what is really happening is they're believing everything is happening to them and they need to turn it around to the possibility that everything isn't happening to them it's actually happening from them which means they can change their perspective of the way they decide to see and go through the situation. Okay, the third part of this was now we begin to live the practice. This is the next step. And whatever arises, we think we should just think never mind. When the tension starts arising and the fear comes pouring in, not to let it overtake us. I'm not saying there's no such thing as fear and don't be scared of the situation. It puts you on a high alert and puts you on a um, aware system almost for fight or flight in the situation that they're in. But never, to, never mind the tension inside, we need to let it go, forgive it, and then give it a little space with an ounce of compassion. Compassion, again, has space in it as you relax your mind and keep on living in the present time. Keep that in mind. And outwardly, you choose to apply loving kindness. You smile into what you are doing. No matter how far it is you have to walk, you keep going. And share any joy that you are feeling and give away your smile to those who cannot smile each day. Practice applying our attention to one task at a time, which is what the theme of this really is, and only one thing at a time. Practice smiling into your work. Keep your attention light and sharp. Be precise as you witness how things are happening. Remember, drops if you want to. Don't resist or push against what's happening. Soften and smile. And what will happen if you start applying drops, you will notice that you're able to see things more sharply, sharper awareness and clarity with what is going on with comprehension. So you never mind when distractions cause tension to arise. You let go, relax, smile, and come back to where you, where you are. And forgive everything and smile <clears throat> as you watch through an impersonal lens. How everything that arises always passes away. And you're noticing, you're learning Anicca, internally learning Anicca. It can be our friend. It doesn't have to just be a disturbance that things are changing. It can be our friend because it means you're not stuck. You're moving through time, through life, through you're in the river, in the boat. Now try to steer. All things that begin 
come to their end and something starts that is new. Each smile is the first step to forgive and accept continual change. Remember to give your smiles away to one another and smile as you feel any relief. And this too shall pass away. Everything that arises happens and then passes away. We cannot deny that natural law, but keep on going and keep it light just to see what happens next. One way for the children is it's an adventure. It's different in, it's an adventure. Everything is an adventure. They should write about it. They should color it. They should, they should do, you know, have an opportunity to be given food, but to be given crayons, to be given paper, to let the stuff out, to exercise the experience. Keep on going. Keep it light just to see what happens next. And truth be known, the frequency of your smile will reach others around you as you begin to shine. And soon they will shine some too. And this child is how change happens. I am, you are next to me in this, whoever is next to you. And we are being together in this, going through it. Now you know you are the change that you seek for this world. This is part of the secret behind this whole thing, is people want to change the world, but they don't know how to start to change the world, and they keep pausing about changing the world. But the truth is, the change they want is inside of them, and it's time to let it start working. I am, you are, we are being. Now you know you are the change you seek for the world. And what are you waiting for? Turn on the light, turn on the change, and you see in your mind, for the world is waiting. We are all connected and just need to do it. Some of these other notes are about different stories. I'm going to drop out of here now and go back to you all. See how I do that. Here we go. Okay. So that's just some of the material I started with. And then when we had the meeting, it was really great. One of the first things we had was from Bhante Rahula. He's a Mahatera monk and he gave comments about the conventional truth and the ultimate truth and the difference of sharing this with people. That one of the things that happens when you go through trials and things, when you reach a place of heavy trial in life, if we look at it as a complete barrier and a disaster, it can wear us down to the ground. But if we look at it as a challenge instead of a problem, and we look at it as change, unexpected change, and the outcome of unexpected change can end up being good. It doesn't have to mean that Anicca is only going to cause suffering. So Anicca is sort of a neutral word, isn't it? Where it can be our friend or it can be taken as an enemy, but it's up to us what we do with that. Then we had um, comments from Ottawa, Canada, and some of the comments were really beautiful about humility and love and compassion and how humanity is coming out to show us there is love and compassion between people. And the metta that you see with people going on is an unconditional kind of love. The Anich is also called the Paramata Satcha, and this was talked about uh, by Venerable Saranapala. And he's a, a monk that is coming to us from uh, in Toronto. And you have to remember that when you go through life, when you think of all the things that happen when you have a disaster and you leave all the things, all the material things are just gone instantly. And that happened to me once 
uh, we don't have a lot of things when we're monastics, but I had was living in a trailer and it was a new unit and it hadn't been tied down yet when a small tornado hit the center. And one of the things that happened, this was many years back, but it took it up and turned it over and laid it down on a brick on a stone wall and it sort of cracked in half. And that was my little house and it was just gone like that. And then I had to, the message that comes across to you when you look at from the outside, everything is inside that you say, you just can't take it with you. And you don't realize you can't take it with you until something happens like this. And it was quite a challenge to climb into this and have to walk on the ceiling to try to see what was left. And then see that most everything was beyond use and that only a certain things could be uh, saved because it was raining and rain got involved too. And it was pretty bad. So, but we, we present uh, a balancing bar for the mind first, like we talked about. That's one of the, this, the things that can help the person. And when uh, that particular thing happened, I was standing at the gate uh, looking in towards where this happened. And um, 12 of the trees that were there in the lower part where the monastic area is were just gone. They just were uprooted and sucked into the sky and they were gone. The other buildings weren't hurt at all. And then, uh, you know, one of the things, the units we had for driving around the property, because we had a large uh, property, was in a tree. <laughs> so we were amused at everything that was happening, but people that were clearing the road came and helped us to get the vehicle out of the tree down on the ground. And we thought it was pretty cool because we turned the key and it actually started. I think the toughest thing for a disaster is when people go in to help and believe we have to heal someone. And this is not just tough for monastics to deal with. This is tough for medical compassionate service workers also to deal with. And although they have it in school and it's mentioned when you get working in a hospital and I've worked in hospitals over the years, sometimes that compassionate service worker takes it really, really hard when they were unable to save someone and the person died. And what we have to remember is we cannot fix another person. We can help them to fix themselves. We can help them to make the disaster lighter by understanding how it's working with them as a human being in their system. This is the gift or the tool that the Buddha gave us. One of the things that was said once in a story, this came out from one of the monks, um, a venerable um, Shantisobhana, and he told us a story. And the story had to do with a very rich child whose name was Radha. And the father and the mother were older, and they, they saw that when he was growing up, he was spending money and having fun only, and it didn't seem like he was able to take a lot of responsibility. And the parents had one thing they could give him when they were older and they knew they were going to be passing away soon. And the gift was wisdom. And the advice that the father gave the son before he died was, you should learn to become a beggar. In that way, when you become a beggar, you will be able to have contentment because the contentment is not easy to come by when you have a lot of materialistic things and are constantly worried about what might happen to those things. And so in the story, he became a beggar and then later he became a monk and he taught other people 
to live in a slim fashion with less material things and be aware of the contentment that one can have when they are sharing what they have with others and then life can change. And this was a really good story. In part of the story was in order to um, help another person too, why is it so important for us to do our personal work? And the work that we do is basically from the lesson where someone said once to a physician, physician, stop, heal thyself. And the statement was given to the physician who was so exhausted by the fact he could not save his patient. But healing thyself first and stabilizing the mind in reference to Anicca, Dukkha, and Anatta, that sets you up so that you can really help another person with a stable mind. The other thing the father told the son in the story of Radha was that whenever somebody gives you something, you should appreciate it. And the third part of his lesson was, don't ask unnecessary questions. Just do what needs to be done. Well, Radha lived his life as the baker and was careful to listen to the lessons of his father. And one day, Sariputta came by on a pendipot. He was almost 12 noon, and Radha was coming to get food also as a beggar. But when Radha saw the venerable Sariputta, he stepped back and gave Sariputta a chance to get the food and did without. When Radha came later to the temple, there was leftover food from the monks and he realized he could get some food that way. The monks saw him and he, they told the Buddha, Sariputta came and told the Buddha the story of what Radha had done when he stepped back and gave him food. He realized that Radha had an extremely calm mind from his development and that Vipassana wise, he had been sharing and giving and caring about others. So he had completed a training of his own form of samatha and vipassana with a calm mind and with a sharing and openness to help other people. And then he became the monk. That's how it happened. The stories are good that we hear sometimes when we listen to the monks. Monte Kusala is one of the monks that comes, and he's also from the Toronto Temple. And he talked about the abandoning of home and the relatives and the fear that one faces and the grief that is present, the confusion and desperation. These are the words that these folks are facing when they're going through the war that is going on. You close your eyes and think for a minute, what if, what's really happening to them? And it, it happened so quickly because of the invasion tactics that were used. Some of us can remember when it happened in Czechoslovakia and the tanks rolled in on the streets and instantly occurred. But it was a different picture this time. Because this time, the people came together very fast to defend their country and to fight for it, and still are. Kusala told us a, Bhante Kusala told us a farmer story, and the perspective, it's about perspective. And in the lesson about the perspective, I was going to ask, I'm not sure if Bunty's still here or not. 
are you here? I'm not, maybe he's not here. He's really good at telling the story. Yeah, <laughs> I'm here. <laughs> I, I want you to tell the uh -huh. story. Because he told the story in reference to the granary, but you need to uh -huh. tell the story like we were talking about the other day. Uh, the, about the uh, monk, uh, sorry, uh, the, uh, the king and the minister. Yeah, that's the story. Yeah. Uh, so the king, uh, there is a king and he has a minister who is very uh, wise. And uh, one day what happens is that the king, uh, uh, while uh, uh, having his uh, meal, cuts his hand. So the, uh, the monk says that uh, whatever happens, happens for the good. The king uh, kind of becomes angry with uh, the, uh, the minister says, I, I have cut my hand and he's saying that uh, this has happened for something good. So he says that uh, he asks his uh, uh, guards to put him in jail. After that, uh, the king says, uh, I want to go for my hunting trip. So when he goes for the hunting trip, uh, uh, what happens is that uh, there is a, a bear which attacks the uh, hunting trip and the horse uh, kind of uh, panics and uh, all the guards also uh, kind of run away and the, uh, the, uh, the king has fallen on the ground. So he uh, acts as uh, he, if he's dead. And the bear comes and sniffs his hand, which, ha which has a bandage on it. So it is a uh, old wound. Uh, so the bear thinks that this is a dead person because the wound is uh, smelling, uh, uh, it's an old wound. And uh, the bear goes away. Then the, uh, the, uh, the king realizes that the cutting of the hand actually saved his life. That was a good thing which happened. So he went, uh, goes back to the uh, uh, palace and uh, asks his guards to bring the minister back. The, uh, then the uh, king says that uh, I can understand that what happened to me was for the good. But I am sorry for you that uh, you were in jail for no reason. So the minister says that that is not the thing. That also happened for the good. Because see, if I was there with you, uh, and uh, this incident happened, I would not have run away like the guards and I would have uh, be the, uh, I would be there to defend you and maybe the bear would have killed me. So by being me uh, for, by, uh, for uh, uh, as I was there in the jail, I, I was spared that uh, fate also. So that happened for the good. So that is a, a, a kind of perspective of uh, looking at life saying that uh, something, uh, everything happens, uh, which can be kind of taken up positively in a positive light, because one thing leads to another thing. Yeah, it's a great story. <laughs> it's really a good story. So we don't know, you know, um, when challenges come along, I, my grandmother, when I was little, and I would say everything is happening uh, it's, I don't like what's happening. And she would say, you must remember something through life um, that uh, she was uh, big on the belief that, that God would never put anything in front of you that you couldn't handle, that whatever was going to happen in life was going to be some kind of lesson. So she should be looking for the lesson, looking for the, um, the lesson that's inside what is going on and happening. And sometimes the thing is, we just can't see it when it's happening in the midst of it happening. We can see the lesson some most of the time pretty clearly after we get past the incident and what's going on. But that's what she was saying. Always remember that the, the rug or the floor is not going to fall out from underneath you, she would say, because he's there and he's taking flagstones and he's putting them down in front of you so that you can walk on them and there'll always be a stone there. And that if you believe that, then you can keep going. You have to keep going and keep moving. And in life, that's really true. I've found that true over the years that sometimes when you just don't see how you're going to go through what is going on, that you have to come back up and try to remember these stories lift you up and I know that they have a lot of stories in uh, that region of the world where this is going on that are hopeful stories that are being brought up for people to remember. And this is what these stories are for. This is what the preservation for these stories are for. So there were lots of lessons. <clears throat> and the, one of the things I think I get out of uh, these meetings when I go to them 
is it's not time to simply stay and simply hide. There is, even if you want just the quiet and peace and you're upset by what's going on, if you can meditate and send your metta in that direction, instead of for the, may the mind be peaceful, may your mind be calm, may, you, may all beings be safe, may they be, be safe from harm, may they be well, may they be safe from injury, these kinds of things, it's time to be saying these things as you're meditating and closing your eyes and seeing these people getting the help that they need and seeing them helping each other in your minds. You are sending frequencies out. These frequencies can be felt all the way on the other side of the world. This is possible. And the more of us that do it, the stronger it is to help people get through the worst time that they are going through. And let's remember too, you know, this is March. And this uh, country is not uh, totally safe from cold. And the cold is already starting to cause some problems for the children with colds and things like this. And I think that what some of the people have done in Poland is quite remarkable, just coming out and leaving their jobs and collecting clothing and, and coats and everything that people need uh, to help them get through what they need to go through in the rest of the weather before the summer or spring and summer come in. Um, one of the things we want to do for people is teach them breathing meditation. We want to teach them that. Uh, and breathing meditation doesn't have to be taught in a formal way. Breathing, the one thing about breathing meditation when something really scary happens and you have not gotten to a level where there's just no fear that comes up anymore. Okay, people still have fear coming up and your heart rate and your breathing get really exhausting. And one of the things is to sit with a person and have the person in front of you or a group of people and just breathe together and breathe naturally, but breathe together in a rhythmic way in order to calm down pretty quickly. And the best example that we've seen in modern times of how this can save lives is we should never forget the boys in the cave in Thailand. The story was elegant, the story was true, the boys were faced with suffocation and even death and they were helped to survive by one person who was there who taught them to sit together and breathe calmly. And by doing that, they managed to survive long enough for the divers to get in because the water was coming up in the cave and they got caught inside and they managed to get these boys out. So breathing is a very good way of calming yourself down from frightening situations or disasters very quickly to get the blood pressure down and to calm the person. And one thing that's very important, uh, Bhante Rahula also told us about was gratitude and forgiveness and letting go of even yesterday when it was so terrible and forgiving what's happening because human beings, many on many parts of the planet, are lost in their minds and not understanding the real way for humanity to survive on this planet. And we have to forgive them and go on the best we can by teaching each other how we need to continue to survive as a species on this planet. So this is a lesson, as I said earlier, in humanity, watching what's happening and the difference. And you should be proud of your news people this time because they're pointing out the humanity that is coming to the surface in this whole event rather than just talking about the dark side of this whole thing. Now, one of the things is that... Um, it is very hard for people to uh, share sometimes what we're learning in Buddhism. And we talked about uh, the one thing that makes it difficult is when we try to teach something that we haven't experienced ourselves 
and we therefore cannot teach what we do not know ourselves. And in Buddhism, it is emphasized in some of the suttas uh, that show us how to teach, when to teach, and what to teach. And the key to it is you cannot teach until you have found yourself in certain subjects. So when you're stable yourself, you can teach another person. But don't be afraid to help a person to start breathing in an informal way, or certainly not be afraid to teach them the metta for themselves, for their family, and for their community around them. Bhante Nalaka is a Vietnamese monk. He's in Arizona at this time in the United States. And he's talking to us about living the ahimsa, which is the way of peace in, uh, in his tradition. And um, his attempt is to be in harmony with the world. And in harmony with the world and looking at the Four Noble Truths guiding uh, the person to look, keep watching for how the suffering works, how the cause of it works, how the cessation of it can be chosen and followed through and practiced, and then uh, the look at the supports that have been given to us in Buddhism and start to practice them, not just read about them, such as the three characteristics, watching them occurring and for yourself, because that's your knowledge and vision. That's your actual experience. That's what the Buddha was big on. He was really important for him, for his monks, not to just say, I, um, I uh, want to show you this or teach you this without having seen it. And he adamantly told his monks, you must use this knowledge and vision, which is direct experience, and then your confidence comes up, and the more you teach, the more clearer it gets. And Bhante, um, in, um, in Shanta Sobhana in California, was really good to point out that this is the first time we see a president uh, or a minister or leader of a country absolutely not leaving the country and staying with his people and reaching out to the world and saying, okay, this is it, come on, show us how we can be supported to be a free country and continue. Uh, the well, part that didn't make much sense to me was to have uh, 1.8, uh, I, I can't remember what the figure was, uh, it was pretty high, um, gross national product developed in this country to have it crushed instantly before your eyes. And the waste that that was, was shocking to me. That not to work out uh, the situation with more sitting and talking and working it out, but we don't really know what the intentions are totally in the whole situation. We're still waiting to find out. But you're facing, in this case, he pointed out, you're facing the same thing that people faced in the tsunami, the destruction and destroying of just everything. And one has to say, okay, this is a challenge that most people don't face, but when it happens to you, it should be looked at the destruction of everything is the wiping clean of the slate. And okay, the tsunami has done this and I will start again, and the determination to start again. And if you have that determination and are encouraged to believe in yourself, you will try again. No matter where you stand, you will try again. And people will help you if you show this confidence and this hope. And there, the world that we want, once again, the world we think about and want it to be is trickling up to the surface in this event. All over the world, there are movements of people attempting to support the protection of these people and to attempt to uh, say that what has happened has happened totally in the wrong way. Without saying which, 
you know, what is this legitimate for the person coming into the country or is it just totally wrong without talking about any of the politics involved? This is not the way to do things that is logical in the world at this time. So when we look at this and say, I don't know when I can actually do something about this. We're talking about many different ways of doing it, whether you're going to um, ship clothing or you're going to write letters or you're going to send school supplies or you're going to send clothing, whatever it is that's needed at this time, you have to stop and say, if it's not me, then who is going to do it? And if it's not now, when is it going to get done? And you have to take a step in the direction that makes sense to you. The big thing is that for a person to understand this is not hopeless. It is not hopeless. There's no such thing. You are only reacting to the big, huge change that has just happened and this flux, this feeling of everything is leaving, everything is changing. And you have to change the idea of change in your mind and to help people and to help them to talk about it, but not let them get caught, steer them away from why is it happening to me? Why is this happening? Is a crushing, dark, endless tunnel type thing instead of a hopeless, a hopeful thing that help is coming and there's a purpose that can help yourselves and the people on the earth to see how we pull together to help these people. So the big thing we try to do in these meetings at the end is always to send out meta, to send out a hopeful message, to send out information to people to be wise, to be having patience, to help each other and to not isolate themselves and not give up. What we know about the way that the Buddha teaches is that healing through wisdom happens only through discipline. And so we cannot just read these things about Buddhism that we're discussing we have to actually do them. So even if we have a training, a small training, the one thing we must remember is when we work on our training and come to retreat and work on our training, that at the end of that retreat, it's just like somebody went to the hospital and they had a baby and the nurses and the doctors helped them to have the baby. And then you get to the point in the process of having the baby with the pediatrician and the nurse and the doctor. You get to the point, it's time to wrap the baby up and take it home. And when you take it home, whatever advancement, progress, attainments, whatever happened in that retreat are totally in your care. They're not in the care of the guides who helped you see how you could practice to get these attainments and accomplishments. Once you experience these things that we experience in our training, we always have to remember it's a personal responsibility when we go home. So let's open it up. Has anybody got any questions about what I'm saying? You got any other ideas of things we can do to help people? Hey, team. <laughs> uh, um, thank you for, for your talk, uh, Sister Kima. Mm. I just wanted to add a couple of things. Um, first of all, that there's a lot of modern research uh, which kind of corroborates uh, sort of ancient, more ancient teachings around 
uh, trauma being held in the body. Um, and uh, to recognize that uh, tension held in the body, just like tension held in the mind uh, it, with the twin, is something to, that uh, has a great uh, capacity to teach um, for people to learn from. And, and if they can yeah. build, have a soft relationship to tension in the body, this is mm-hmm. a, a really important thing. So one of the things that we teach is what we call softening around the edges and not trying to get rid of the tension in the body, but softening around the edges, which is where the relationship we have to that tension exists. And it's either a rejecting or an accepting. And, uh, and you know, inevitably with, the, with the, all, the, all the things that are happening, there's a, there's a huge um, uh, reflex to, to reject what the body is telling you and to try and push through and to, and to manage and to cope. And these are admirable things, but, but if we can allow people to recognize that the body is also telling, telling them something very helpful, which is the direction towards healing, not curing the problem, but healing. And our relationship to this tension is really important to help people come more into balance. Um, and it can be very it can be very helpful uh you know you talk about the activities for children well that's a way of them processing the stuff that's held and and getting it out adults have more problem doing this um Mm. and another thing is literally just shaking the body just physically shaking from the center not not outwardly but from the center working as it were from the inside out shaking the body out and this is very helpful to also um, uh, give another mechanism for, uh, or another route for this tension to be expressed and, and, and easy yeah. now. So like a, a form of discharging the, yeah. Yeah. discharging the, what could become scars in the body, discharge yeah. methods of movement to discharge these things before they turn into scars that, um, are kept inside and also in, in, uh, instead of allowing them to stay inside to build up to PTSD. Yeah. 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 Because the early, my, the early my, days my, are, really, yeah. Re, are yeah. really important. And, and then very simple things like uh, humming. If they don't have a, a tradition of singing or chanting or, or, or that humming, because uh, part of the mechanism of the body which releases this tension is the parasympathetic, the rest and digest response. And that's triggered by the vagus nerve. And the vagus nerve has its, one of, it, one of the areas where the muscles affect the vagus nerve are deep diaphragmatic breathing, which you were talking about with the breath meditation, but also in the larynx and the pharynx. And so simple humming triggers Absolutely. this vagal response. Yeah. We call this toning, toning. Yep. Yep. Because toning, and even, you know, when you're using the ohm, you can use the ohm sound. And what happens with a person that is injured, uh, when you do the ohm sound, it sounds like ohm, like that, but there's no vibration in the skull at all like this. But if I go ohm. Yeah. The whole entire skull is vibrating and but the, Yeah, I, I agree. But the you know, OM has certain associations which may people may recognize or may not. But you could literally just tell people just hum your favorite tunes. Yeah, it actually isn't from any particular religion. If you research it, it comes into the sound that's in the earth. And if we if we go into the earth deeper and deeper, we are not able to hear you. Yeah. yeah. Mm. Yeah. Oh, what? I'm sorry. <laughs> Can you hear me? Can you hear me? You Your volume's gone down. You become like a mouse. I came like a mouse. <laughs> <laughs> okay, maybe I should try that. I don't know. What did I do? Oh, that's, better. that's better. Yeah. <laughs> that's better. Okay. I covered it with a, a pad. Sarma, did you have something for this? I need no help. Yeah, how are you? Fine. Yeah? Are we doing help? Much better.